Thanks for the invite. I'm very happy to be here. It's a beautiful campus and a beautiful town that you have. It's my first time here, so uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to see your great town. So I want to start by the acknowledgments. Um, lots of people helped make this work that I'm going to talk about happen. As you know, research is not a single person endeavor, it's a team. And I had a really great team around me and they're sort of the brains and the work behind it. So thanks to them. Uh, I don't have any disclosures. I have been a co-investigator on some drug company studies, but none of that is reported today. So it's good to start with a sort of big picture view. So why should we look at conduct problems in kids? What's important about this? Well, there's a number of reasons. Number one, it's one of the most common reasons parents bring their kids in for help. So when I work in a clinic at least one day a week, and that's one of the most common reasons that they come in and say, you know, I need help with uh, this child. It has a huge impact on families and on uh, schools. So this is the main thing that schools are worried about outside of sort of learning disabilities is this kid is disrupting the classroom and ruining the work environment. And the same thing is true with parents. So even if you just have one child with conduct problems, the impact on the siblings is really uh, pretty large. And of course, it's also got a negative impact on the kids themselves. They have much worse outcomes if you have conduct problems as a kid, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's not an uncommon thing, so it depends on what study you look at, but you know, one in 10 kids to one in 20 kids uh, has, uh, kid, has conduct problems, and very costly. So if you add up all the cost to society from missed work on the part of parents to school resources that they put in and so on, and we're spending a huge amount of money on conduct problems. So when I talk about conduct problems, I'm going to refer to oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder. So these are DSM-4 categories. Uh, the only thing I wanted to say about this is that we have this component right here, which is you need serious impairment to diagnose kids with ODD or CD. So these are not just kids who they are a little rambunctious or uh, a little more challenging. These are kids who are exhibiting serious behaviors and it's causing them real life problems with how they get along with others, with their functioning in school, with their functioning uh, with their parents and so on. And that's always, you know, there are lots of skeptics out there about psychology in general, and especially when you talk about behavior problems in kids, there's often an attitude of, you know, boys will be boys or kids are just being kids. And that's true for some kids, but for the kids we see in treatment, we've taken that into account by requiring impairment. These kids need help. So one of the big presses in this area of research is uh, trying to get a better understanding on kids with conduct problems. And we know that it's helpful to have a diagnosis that gives us a good starting point for research, good starting point for treatment. But we also know that it's kind of a one-size-fits-all uh, approach to understanding conduct kind of problems. And there's a lot of differences within this group. Ralph Lober uh, had an excellent career studying this very thing and has made substantial progress. And one of the things that he has pointed out is that the value of understanding these individual differences is tangible. So if we can understand not just at the level of does this kid have behavior problem, but what type of behavior problem do they have? And are there meaningful differences at that level? Then we can make our treatments more specific, make our research more powerful. And so that's a really big uh, press in the last decade or so is trying to understand variants within the group of conduct problem kids. Probably the best known subtyping within conduct problems is between kids who have problems early in life and kids who have problems later in life. And there's different ways to refer to that. Childhood onset versus adolescent onset is probably the most common, but it's also early onset or life course persistent. Kids with early onset conduct problems are the kids who are temperamentally difficult from a very young age. They're irritable, they're hyperactive, and that kind of grows from there. So they become more defiant when they're in uh, elementary ages, and then as uh, teenagers, they get into more serious antisocial behavior. Research on causes of these problems show that we have both uh, contextual and dispositional uh, characteristics that are so associated with this group. So there's things about them, their genetics or biology that contributes to their problems, and there's things about their environment that contribute to it. All of that is in contrast to the teenager adolescent onset group. They tend to have more contextual, less likely to have dispositional factors. So it's their environment that seems to drive it. And really what the latest theories or what established theories suggest is that you have kids who are rough from the beginning, and as a result of that, they get a lot of secondary reinforcement, right? So schools are organized around them, parents are spending a lot of time with them, extra time compared to other kids. Sometimes they even have their own lawyers, right? The teenagers want to be treated as adults. And so a subset of teenagers looks at the childhood onset group and says, boy, that kid really gets a lot by being bad, right? They don't have to go to school. Uh, they get all this attention from it. So maybe that's the way to become, uh, be treated like a grown-up is to misbehave. It's more of a reaction to their 
uh, position in society than it is sort of something about them. And this is very well established. If you had to pick one of the two, the childhood onset is the one that you want to focus on if your aim is to reduce conduct problems in kids. So probably the most well-known example of this is the Dunedin Longitudinal Study. So this is a study that uh, measured every kid that was born in Dunedin, New Zealand for an entire year. So from January 1st through December 31st, every child was recruited and the vast majority of them agreed to be in the study. And they followed them up every other year throughout their life and now they're in their mid-30s, I believe. It's a gold mine for studying the impact of early factors on later uh, outcomes and development. And what they found is that 10% of the kids who had early onset conduct problems accounted for a majority of antisocial behaviors when they were 26 years old. Uh, so what that really suggests to me is that if we can find this small group of kids who have these early onset conduct problems, then we can really make a big impact in improving our society, improving the outcomes of these kids. But it's not that simple. So just because you have conduct problems as a youngster doesn't mean that you're going to have a negative outcome. And in fact, about half of kids who have conduct problems at age 10 go on to have later antisocial behavior, but that means half of them don't. So we really need to look at what are the factors that discriminate those two groups of kids. And one factor that's proven useful in the last decade or so is callous and emotional traits. So what are callous and emotional traits? It's a downward extension of psychopathy. So uh, many of you I know are familiar with psychopathy. What we typically think is that these are kids who lack remorse or guilt after they misbehave. So they act against somebody else, they do something wrong, and they just don't feel as bad afterward as other kids do. They also lack empathy for others. So if they see other kids get hurt, if they hurt another kid, they don't feel as bad for the other person as most other kids do. They are unconcerned about their own performance. So if you ask them, hey, you're, you know, you're getting a failing grade here in school, does that bother you? And they just don't care as much as other kids do. And they have a shallow or deficient affect. So they may pretend like they feel sad after an event happens, but if you could measure up, have a pure measure of their emotion, it just wouldn't be the same as it is for other kids. This is now considered well enough established that it's been integrated in the current version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So it's a modifier of conduct disorder in the DSM-5, which was just published a couple of years ago. So that's nice. It's a good sort of uh, sterilized explanation of what callous and emotional traits are. But you know, as I'm going to preview in a little bit here, I was a skeptic coming into this area. And so I like to look for real life examples of it. And in fact, there have been a number in, in uh, recent years. Here's one, a fifth grader is charged with murder and conspiracy and danger to other people. So charged boys 10 or 11 with conspiracy commit murder. And as you can see, plotted to stab a girl and the, uh, because she was really annoying. Did not display any emotion or remorse during the interview, right? Real life example, wish it were the only one. Here's one from October 2013. So this was a little girl who commit suicide in Florida after she was bullied so badly that she decided her life wasn't worth living anymore. And as you can see on the quote up there, the uh, people who did the bullying her, uh, of her on social media basically said, I don't care. You know, she killed herself. Good. That's fine with them. June 2014. So this was people you trust are very gullible. I thought that was kind of the main quote. I believe this was the slender man killing here. Another one in October 2014, a boy bludgeoned his grandmother to death and showed no remorse afterwards. And then the most recent one in Tennessee, a boy was held for killing an eight-year-old girl just this month because the girl wouldn't let them see the pet or the animal that they had. So these are not things that are just an academic construct. This is stuff that we actually see in real life. And I think it's worth studying if for no reason to get a better handle on that. So I want to sidetrack a little bit here and tell you how I got interested in this area. And the reason is that that kind of previews my talk or gives a bit of an organization to the talk. So as Steve mentioned, uh, we started our careers at the exact same time in Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And as you can see, this is the building we walked into every day. And we started literally the same day. We quickly decided that uh, we were either going to get along really well or drive each other nuts. Unfortunately, we got along pretty well. and we, uh, We've been friends ever since. So <laughs> this is us as young assistant professors. I don't know why I look so much older now and he still looks very young. Must be the <laughs> good Canadian air, I think. But, uh, Literally the first day that we met, we went out uh, for a cup of coffee and talked about our research. And uh, as it turned out, I learned three things that day that changed my life. Each thing changed my life in a different way. First of all, he introduced me to Tim Horton's coffee. <laughs> so I remain uh, addicted to it and I'm a big fan. Second, I learned how to pronounce Newfoundland. 
It's not Newfoundland, right? I didn't know that before. And that led me to realize I need to learn more about Canada, and eventually I became a Canadian citizen, so I'm a dual citizen now. And most relevant to this talk, I remember asking them this question in, in particular, what's psychopathy? Which we'll set aside to talk about why I didn't know that before and how I should have, but it was very fascinating to me. And the first thing I thought to myself is, geez, if this is in adults, maybe this is in kids too, or where does it come from? As a developmental clinical psychologist, that was sort of the first thing that popped in my mind. So I went and back to my office and did a little research and found that actually people are starting to study this. So that's where my career took off from. I have to say, as I learned about this, I wasn't, I didn't buy into it. I thought this, is, I don't, I just don't believe that this could happen in kids, right? So I asked myself a lot of skeptical questions and I wanna go through some of what those questions are. So as a take home message at the risk of giving you unsolicited advice to those who are younger, seek out opportunities to talk about your research always take the, the opportunity, if somebody offers you to buy you coffee and talk about your research, do it. Because most of them are enjoyable. 90% of them might end up being a waste of time or don't come from it. But it, even if just one works out, you can really further your research and it can have a real impact on you. So here's what I hope to answer today, or hope to address today. First of all, I want to talk about whether CU is just a measurement problem. Because as I'll point out in just a minute, that was my first thought was, Maybe this is just how they're measuring it, and it's just a confound, and we already know all this stuff already. I want to talk about whether they're prevalent enough to care about, right? So these are very serious behaviors. Is this happen enough that we should really focus on it? Should we study CU traits, right? So if these behaviors are there, just like studying psychopathy can be very stigmatizing, maybe, this, maybe the same thing will happen if we study this in kids, and maybe we shouldn't just touch that. Do they matter, right? Is this something that's going to add to our knowledge, or is it a dead end? And if they do matter, what can we do to help kids who have these traits? I have too much material, so I'm gonna breeze over a lot of the details, which you know, kills the methodologist in me. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about a lot of the details of this study. Almost all of this stuff is either published or under review or in press. I'm happy to send papers about anything that people are interested in. I do wanna talk about the two primary samples where a lot of this data was done. So both of these were collected in, when I was at Nova Scotia. One of them was the Behavior Education Support and Treatment study, and that one was a school-wide intervention that we did with a school district in North Central Nova Scotia. And we ended up collecting the first year of the study, parent ratings on about 800 kids and teacher ratings on about 1,500 kids. And they were disruptive behaviors as well as a little bit of internalizing. And then I also ran a summer camp when I was up there, a summer treatment program, which is, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but it's a summer camp intervention for disruptive kids, and we ran that for three years. And as part of that, we recruited more broadly. So we evaluated about 180 kids. And so I have parent ratings from all of them and teacher ratings from most of them. And then the kids who were actually in the camp, we have behavioral data on them. So what was their behavior like when they were in camp? And so those ends range from about 108 to 180. So I had to have a excuse to embarrass Steve a little bit. So this is the data that we were collected was when we were in Halifax. And just to give you an idea how long ago that is, this is my daughter, uh, Zoe, and this is her today along with my other kids. Uh, Dr. Woodworth, I couldn't find a suitably embarrassing picture, but just to make him feel old, this is his daughter when she was in our apartment in Halifax, and I found this on the internet. That's her in uh, the cover of the recent magazine. So what I like about this picture is I don't know who is uh, more uncomfortable here, the baby or Steve and <laughs> holding the baby. I think that was probably the first time you ever held a baby, which was maybe a month after it was the first time I ever held a baby, so. Anyway, back to the real meat of the talk here is, uh, so is CU just a measurement problem? Now, that was my first thought, is this is not a real area of study. This is just a confounder. I'll tell you why I thought that. Here was the main measure of callous and emotional traits at the time. It was called the psychopathy screening device. This is uh, early 2000. It's since been published and changed the name to the antisocial process screening device. It's now been replaced by newer measures, but this is where it all started. And as you can see, here's the six items that are on the APSD. And in my mind, when I looked at it, I thought half of those items are just getting at impairment. And we've known forever that impairment adds to symptoms. If you ask how inattentive a kid is, that will tell you information, but if you ask, how inattentive is this kid, and how are their peer relationships? That gives you more information. So I thought this is just a marker for impairment. The other problem I had with this, if you look at almost all of these items are phrased positively. Is the child concerned about how well they're doing in school? So you're evaluating callous and emotional traits by the absence of positives. 
And in my mind, that's very different than asking about the presence of negatives. And there's data now to support that. So I thought, you know, this had been sort of in the works now for five years at the time I was studying this, and I thought, this is all just bunk. This is all just mapping onto impairment, and once we take that into account, it's all going to go away. So I looked at that in a couple different ways. One way I did it was I looked at partial correlations of the APSD. So I looked at what's the correlation between impairment and aggression if you look at those impairment items and you factor out the affective items. And then the same thing for what if you look at affect and, and partial out the impairment items. So the important thing here is you look at these columns in red boxes and you can see when you ask teachers, almost every case, after you take those impairments out of the mix, the correlations are higher as compared to after you take the affect out of the mix. So it looks like there really is something to the affect of which I thought was the more important part. With parents, the same general trend is there. It's not quite as strong, but the same thing is there. So the most of the areas, the affect of partialing out the impairment is stronger than the impairment factoring out the affect. So I thought, oh, well, maybe there is something to this, but I wasn't convinced yet. So what we did next is we thought, well, what if we just develop a new measure? What if we measure, develop a measure that takes the impairment out of it? So we design the items to get impairment out of the mix, and then we ask about the negatives rather than ask about the absence of the positives. So uh, some psychopathy experts, which was Steve and a, a friend of his, Hugh, from uh, I think he's in Bob Hare's lab and myself, generated some items. And what we came up with was lacking remorse, uh, seemed to be uh, enjoy being mean, and cold or uncaring, right? So it directly asks about the negative aspects of callous and unemotional traits. Put those in the school intervention we were doing, so we got data on a huge number of kids. And then basically looked at those correlations again. So we have impairment and we have different aspects of aggression. And you can see at least for teachers, when you're directly asking about it, taking impairment into account, you find significant correlations there. Not quite as strong for parents, but you do find the same general trend. It's not just a marker for impairment, and it is valid when measured directly. In other words, it's not just the absence of a positive, it's also the presence of a negative that we're tapping into here. Okay, so maybe it is something real, but is it real enough? Is it common enough that we should care about this? Or is this like a one in a million type of condition that uh, thankfully we, we don't have to worry about because it's so rare we'll never be able to find it? So the first thing to note is a lot of people have looked at this question, but most of it is in teenagers or in adolescents. So in teenagers, you can see it's about 20% of adolescent offenders have uh, high callous and unemotional traits. In community settings, about 1% of kids, so this is a general population of kids, 1% of kids meet both conduct disorder and callousness uh, criteria. Another 1% meets criteria for uh, 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 conduct disorder only, and then 3% are high in callousness, but there's not evidence that they're antisocial. And that's an area that's getting a lot of attention lately. Equally interesting is if you ask people who are in the trenches, people who provide treatment, and you describe callousness, and they will say, yes, I've treated kids like this. So despite the fact that we have no empirically supported treatments for these groups, these kids are showing up to clinics, right? So it's common enough that people in the trenches think that they have seen it. So I looked at some data at this to look at it a different way. And what I did at first is I looked at what's the distribution of callous scores, and this is on the antisocial process screening device that we just talked about. What's the distribution within kids who I see in my clinic? And so you can see here, uh, roughly normal distribution. So you have some kids who are low, lots of kids in the middle, and some kids who are high, and it's the same whether you're a girl or a boy. Right, that's in a Halifax sample. Cut the data the same way if you look at it diagnostically. So in the one color bar here, you see kids without ODD or CD, and you see a roughly normal distribution. So some of these are typically developing kids that we recruited for research. Some of them are kids with ADHD only, don't have conduct problems. In the blue bars here, you have kids with ODD, and you see the same distribution. And then the other color there, you have conduct disorder kids. So the distributions are shifted, but in all cases, there's no clear cut point between high callus and non callus. It's more of a spectrum than it is a yes no construct that we're talking about. The same thing has come up now. This is a different sample. So this is a sample we gathered in Florida, which is about 150 kids. If you ask parents versus teachers, you find the same thing, roughly normal distribution. So the take home message is yes, these are common traits, right? So if you look at 
uh, general populations, you find 1% uh, of kids with both clinic problems and callousness and another 3% who have just callousness but are at risk for later conduct problems as some data shows. And to me more important is it's normally distributed. So it's not really the right question to say are you callous or not, it's more how much callousness does this child have. And if you look carefully at the existing studies, you see that everybody uses a different cut point and it's often sample specific. There's really a lack of normative data which is really holding back this area because it's hard to compare across different studies. So that's an area if you're looking for uh, making your mark, that's a good area to look into, is how can we uh, define normative data on these kids? Should we study this? That was the next question. Okay, they're there. This is a real measurement issue. Is this something we should be looking into? And there are important ethical considerations here. This is a risky area to study in the sense that just like psychopathy, there's the potential for high stigmatization even if we call it callous and unemotional. And the reason we call it that, it used to be called psychopathic traits and sometimes still is, but they changed it to callous and unemotional traits because it downplays that link and the theory is that it downplays the uh, association with psychopathic traits and therefore downplays the stigmatization. But any parent with Google is gonna be able to learn that connection in about two and a half seconds. So even if we change the name, we still have that potential of uh, labeling a kid in a a very stigmatizing condition. And of course, there's many people who believe that psychopathic traits are a stable, untreatable condition, and so they're gonna look and say, well, if these kids have the same traits, then that must mean that they're um, untreatable and maybe we should give up on them, and that's a big risk. Personally, I think that risk can be mitigated. I think what's happening here is we have a very powerful tool, and like any tool, it can be used correctly or it can be used incorrectly. So if we're careful with how we use the language that we use, uh, as we're studying this area, that can help mitigate these risks. And of course, there's potential benefits. What's the alternative here? If we don't study these traits, that doesn't mean that they're gonna go away. It just means that we're gonna be ignorant of them. So the stigmatization of this kid could still come about because they're displaying highly antisocial behavior. And we may miss our opportunity to change that kid's trajectory for the better. So yeah, there are risks to using this construct in kids, but there are also risks for not using it lack of knowledge, lack of improved treatment, and uh, risking that we may miss our window to change our trajectory. When I was at Florida doing some research here for a couple years, uh, we had a reporter from the New York Times <coughs> Magazine come and follow us around for a couple days to see what it was like to treat these kids and uh, publish the study in the New York Times Magazine. And it gave a good opportunity to understand what the general reaction is to callous and unemotional traits. How do they think about them? So granted, this is a biased sample because it's um, people who read the article and decided to comment on it and were able to comment on it, but it's nonetheless an informative snapshot. So some people were very supportive in their feel for the parents. You know, I can really feel for the parents. They obviously have their hands full and I, I wish them the best and I pray for them and those kinds of, I sympathize, I empathize with the parents. Very supportive. There were the opposite reactions, very harsh reactions. This kid is a monster. Why would you even let this kid be in school? Why would you let this kid be around their siblings? Lock them up, throw away the key. That's the reaction we all fear as researchers in this area is um, people are gonna see it as an untreatable condition and we should give up with these kids because uh, they're gonna do more harm than good. Um, my personal favorite and the most popular comment on there was that one. <laughs> which maybe has some truth to it, because there is a potential upside to being callous. So our natural inclination, or at least mine, is that this is all downside because we've applied this to kids who have antisocial behavior. But if you have these traits and you don't have the accompanying antisocial behavior, you might do very well in life. So one example, self-reported traits for success for a venture capitalist, one of the most important ones is insensitivity, right? You can't let it get you down if you fail. You have to keep plowing on. You can't be so emotional, get so upset when you fail that you're gonna give up. And arguably, kids with callousness might be that way. A Couple other quotes here. So an anonymous CEO, a road to the top is hard, but it's easier to climb if you leave yourself up on others, faster if they think something's in it for them. So this was, uh, I think this was in Kevin Dalton's book, which I noticed Steve was uh, quoted in, so uh, that was excellent to see. And my favorite quote, I have no compassion from those whom I operate on. 
That is a luxury I simply cannot afford. When I am in the theater, I am reborn as a cold, heartless machine, totally at one with scalpel, drill, and saw. When you're cutting loose and cheating death high above the snow line of the brain, feelings aren't fit for purpose. Emotion is entropy and seriously bad for business. I've hunted it down to extinction over the years. So that was a very successful neurosurgeon. And that's the guy, if I ever need neurosurgery, I want him operating on me, right? I don't want him worrying about his kids, his wife, his mortgage payment. I want him focused like a laser beam, uncaring about whether it's gonna hurt me or not. I just wanna be cured. So take home message here is that Yes, there is a risk for stigmatizing, but that's the case for any mental health condition and lots of physical health conditions as well. But that doesn't mean that we should give up and not study this area. What we need to do is we need to be careful and we need to challenge our own thinking. Just because a kid is high in callousness doesn't mean that they're gonna end up you know, in the jail 25 years later. So we know that it happens. We know that we can measure it and measures have gotten a lot better since then. Doesn't matter. Is this just chasing a dead end road that looks interesting on paper but doesn't really get us anywhere? If you're interested in this area, this is an excellent place to start. So Paul Frick is kind of the granddaddy of this area. He's the guy who put in a lot of work in this area in the mid 90s and really developed it into the area that it is today. So he's uh, recently published a review in Psychological Bulletin that looked at all the studies done to date, I think since 2012 or 2013 and found 296 studies, lots of those in the last couple of years. I saw a graph not too long ago that looked at publications in this area that was almost exponential. So it's really an exciting time to do research here. And what he found, if you have a kid with conduct problems, looking at CU traits within that kid does tell you lots of information. In other words, CU moderates conduct problems in many different areas, in biological measures, emotional measures, cognitive measures, and behavioral measures. I'm gonna give you some examples of that. Arguably one of the most important is antisocial behavior. So you can see there's lots of studies looking at that and the vast majority of them show that kids with callousness who also have conduct problems are much more antisocial in a lot of different ways as compared to conduct problems alone. They have more variable antisocial behavior and more severe antisocial behavior. Essie Vitting did a study of uh, twins looking at the different population variants of conduct problems or antisocial measures in kids with and without callous and unemotional traits. And this kind of orangish color there is variance attributable to genetics. And you can see in those who have both conduct problems and callousness, this is a huge area. Whereas those without callousness, it's a much smaller area. So it does seem to think that there's something more genetically driving the antisocial behavior of these kids with callousness. I've done a number of studies looking at different areas. I want to talk briefly about those. One of the areas that I looked at with one of my uh, now former graduate students is uh, parenting. And a really interesting uh, way to look at this is look at, we've known for a long time that different aspects of parenting predict antisocial behaviors in kids. And in, that, in fact, that's why parent interventions are the most effective uh, treatment for antisocial behavior in kids. There's not a single uh, treatment that doesn't include a parenting component. Sometimes it's also supplemented with other things, but every effective uh, intervention for conduct problems in kids has a parenting component to it. So we know that there's a link between parenting and conduct problems, and so people have looked at whether CU traits moderate that link, and in fact there is a number of studies now that show that. This is one that we did. So this is positive involvement. Here's kids without callousness, and you can see the less involvement you have, the more antisocial you are. The more involvement you have, the less antisocial you are. With callousness added to the mix, there's really no association there. And that's been shown in a number of different studies. And what's interesting here is that the rates of conduct problems are higher in the callousness no matter what. So it's almost like they have high antisocial behavior regardless of the parenting that they experience, although I'm saying that too strongly. And it's not just involvement. A similar trend emerges if you look at poor monitoring and supervision. So again, the rates of antisocial behavior in the callous kids is higher than the other kids. And there's a significant trend among those who don't have callousness. So parenting seems to affect their antisocial behavior more than it does for the callous kids. And the same thing is true in inconsistent discipline. So again, there's a, a significant trend here. Here it's actually a reverse trend among the callous kids but always the callous kids are more antisocial than the other kids. So again, I don't wanna say that parenting is not important, but I would argue that our traditional understanding of how parenting is linked 
to antisocial behavior is probably different depending on whether you have callousness or not. And that has implications for treatment, which we'll talk about later. What about social functioning? And I looked at this also empirically looking at a lab task. So it looked at a response to provocation or response to teasing. So teasing is a really important area to examine because that's one of the things that really differentiates uh, conduct problem kids from other kids, right? All kids get teased. Sometimes it's mean-spirited teasing, sometimes it's not. How you react to that teasing, how you deal with it, is one of the factors that discriminates those who have antisocial from non-antisocial behaviors. So it's a hard thing to study in the real world because even though it's a, it's a relatively common behavior, it's a, it's a hard behavior to observe because if you send adults out to, in the field, that reduces teasing, right? Kids are less likely to tease if they know they're being supervised. So you have to do it in non-obtrusive observational ways and that just gets really expensive. So what we've done instead is we've set up uh, lab tasks to try to simulate how kids respond to teasing and that's uh, one of the studies I'm going to talk about now. So in this study we had 60 kids who were we divided into those without any condition, those who had conduct problems and those who had both conduct problems and callous and emotional traits and we had them do a tailor aggression task. So what that is is you tell kids you're going to go against another kid in a different room and you're going to compete to see who can push the button fastest as soon as you see the stimuli, right? As soon as you see an X on the screen, push the button as fast as you can. In reality, there was no other kid. They were playing against the computer so that we could control when they win and when they lost and that was kept the same across all the kids in the study. After they lost, two things happened. One is they lost some points for this game that they were playing. So they were playing a task we told them whoever ends up with the most points gets to pick the better prize, right? So they were motivated to win. If you lose, the other kid can take between zero and 10 points from you and they're gonna give you a message. If you win, you can do the same thing to the other opponent. You can send a message, right? So then we divided the opponents, the fake opponent's responses, we divided them into low provocation or low teasing conditions and high provocation or high teasing conditions. So in the low provocation condition, the opponent said, you tried hard, uh, I'm only gonna take zero, one, or two points, um, and then they would move on. That's an example, right? So it was different every time, but it was very low levels of provocation. On the high provocation, it was just the opposite. Nice job, Speedo, your hand's stuck in cement, I'm taking nine points, I'm taking 10 points. Way to go, dork, my grandma's faster than you. That was another one that we had. And then what we did is we rigged it so that every time a kid lost, the next trial they won. So we could look at what happens right after you're provoked, either at a low level or you're provoked at a high level. How do you then react to your opponent? All right, so they could send a message to them and they could take a number of points and re recorded the messages that they sent. After every trial, whether they won or lost, we also had them self-report anger. How mad are you right now on a scale of zero to four? And that was anchored using cartoon faces. So the first thing we did is we set it up. So they did about, I think, 60 trials of this. And the first set of trials, the first four trials, they always won. So before they had received any provocation from their opponent, how do they react? And you can see the kids who were callous come out of the gate being aggressive. So they take more points from the other kid even before they've experienced, have any experience with the kid. They haven't uh, read a thing from them, they have no experience about their behavior, but they're still being aggressive towards them. However, their anger doesn't differ. No kid here is angry because they haven't lost yet, but the callous kids are being aggressive right out of the gate no matter that they're not angry. After they experience provocation, they react aggressively if it's a high level of provocation. So if somebody calls you a dork, it's perfectly normal to act aggressively back. That's true whether you have conduct problems, conduct problems and callousness, or whether you're just a typically developing kid. So that's not where you see differences among kids. Where you see differences is the low levels of provocation, which is really non-provocative. Here, Again, the callous kids are saying, I don't care that I've received a low level of provocation, I'm gonna to continue to act aggressively. Interestingly, this group was really low, the conduct problem only group was also really low. And our interpretation of that is they're trying really hard to get to be friends with the other kids, and so they're giving them the benefit of the doubt. Are they angry when they're doing that? No, 
They're more angry when they've been highly provoked than not, but no differences among kids in terms of their anger. So again, backing up a slide here, the callous kids are being more aggressive in the absence of anger. The last thing we did is at the end of the trial, we had a number of trials in a row where we looked at how they behaved over time after they received high levels of provocation. So what we did is we had a very provocative trial right here, and then we let the kid win six trials in a row. And we measured how does their aggression change over time. And what you can see is the callous kids maintain their aggression over time longer than the other kids do. So everybody drops over time, but the callousness leads to kids dropping their behavior more slowly than the non-callous kids. And again, anger doesn't seem to play into it, at least self-reported anger. So they're not saying they're any more ticked off at the other kid, but nonetheless they're behaving more aggressively over time. So more evidence that callous and emotional traits matter, right? What about a cognitive measure? We haven't talked about that yet. One that we just submitted not too long ago, we looked at the stop signal task. And this is a, one of the most well-established lab tasks for studying impulsivity. So this comes out of the ADHD literature. And what it purports to measure is the, your ability to stop yourself once you get started. So think about a baseball player. They, they're watching the ball, they start to swing, and then they gotta decide, go or no go. And if it's a ball, ideally they pull back, right? Other baseball, like you watch little kids play baseball and it's, I'm going whether that's a ball or a strike or anything in between. So that's, that's that ability. How can you stop yourself once you get started? And the way you do that is you give them a reaction time task, a choice task. So you show X's or O's on the screen and you say every time you see an X, hit this button. Every time you see an O, hit that button and do it as fast as you can. However, on 25% of the trials, Every now and again, you're going to hear a beep. When you hear a beep, stop yourself from reacting. And the computer then changes when that beep happens relative to their average, right? So sometimes the beep's going to happen right before, on average, they hit the beep. So they have very little time to stop themselves. And sometimes the beep's going to happen right after they, on average, start their action. So they have a lot of time, right? It's like telling the baseball player, you have to stop swinging right now at the beginning versus telling them they have to stop now at the end of their, of their swing. So that's what we're doing. We're measuring how much time do they need, how much warning do they need to stop. So lower means you have better ability to control your behavior, to stop your behavior once starting. And what we found in the kids without conduct problems, callousness was unrelated to their performance on the stop task. It was basically flat. Among kids with conduct problems, it was inversely related. So the more callousness you had, the lower your stop task was, which meant that if you're callous and conduct problems, you have a better ability to stop your behavior once started as compared to if you have conduct problems alone. And in fact, if you look at all of these dots here are about the same level. So everybody except the conduct problem callous kids have about the same level, and that's the level that is typical in studies of, if you look at a meta-analysis of this task, it falls about there, whereas the kids with callous and emotional and conduct problems, they actually are much lower than the other groups. So they have, it seems like, a better ability than most kids to stop their behavior. So it's not just that they are sort of full throttle, I'm going ahead, it's that they are thinking about, or at least able to think about and stop their behavior more so than you typically think a conduct problem kid does. And finally, we looked at what are they like in real life settings? So if you have antisocial behavior in classrooms, how does it show? And so we did a little study where we looked at, had teachers record rule violations for everybody and their kid over the course of a year. And we did some uh, cluster analyses and trajectory analyses. And it was, again, the conduct problem callous kids who maintained high numbers of rule violations over the course of the year. They start off higher and they maintain that over the course of uh, the school year. So CU traits do matter. What it means is that CU moderates conduct problems. So within the group of conduct problems, those with higher and lower callousness do differ in many ways. And importantly, it's not just a simple CU traits is always bad story, 
there seems to be areas where kids with CU traits actually do better than kids without CU traits. So it's not just kind of a global generic severity factor. Something different seems to be happening. Which brings us to the last question, which is, what do we do about this? What are the treatment implications here? So Frick in his study found that uh, as of a year ago, there are 24 studies. Most of these are with teenagers. There's not much work in kids who are in elementary school or younger. And 20 of the 24 found that there are differences between conduct problem kids with and without callous and emotional traits. And most of those found that the kids with callousness do worse in response to treatment than the kids without callousness. So they start off with more antisocial behavior and they respond less well to treatment than other kids do. So what do we do about that? Well, I would argue there's a couple things we need to do. I think we need behavioral treatments. There's not a single mental health condition that doesn't have a behavioral treatment that's effective for it. It may not be the only effective treatment, and sometimes you need to add other things to behavioral treatment, but behavioral treatments are the single most effective approach to treating mental health problems that we have. And I think the same is true for conduct problems. So I don't think we need to throw out behavior therapy. I think that would be a mistake. But what I do think is we need to think outside the box when it comes to behavior therapy. I think we need to do that plus other stuff, or we need to look at how to modify behavioral treatments to make it maximally effective for this group. I studied that in two different ways, and the way I did that is I looked at that in the summer treatment program. So the summer treatment program is where you deliver intensive behavioral treatments in a summer camp-like setting. So you run a summer camp, and the kids are coming there and they're doing kid stuff. They're playing soccer, they're playing basketball, they're going into classrooms, sometimes we have a computer classroom. As they're doing that, you implement uh, behavioral treatments as well as other treatments in that context. So while they're playing soccer, if they get overly aggressive, they lose points for being aggressive. If they do a good job, they earn points for doing a good job. And then you use that to motivate them. You use that daily and you use that weekly to give them incentive to improve their behavior. There's a lot of advantages of that. One is that kids like it. They enjoy coming to treatment, which I can tell you is not all that common. Rarely do kids say, I can't wait to go to treatment tomorrow. But with this camp, if we're doing our job right, it's just a fun summer camp and we kind of sneak the treatment in there. And the biggest advantage is by doing it this way, we are relying on ourselves to translate treatment for the kids. Right? We're not relying on the kids to translate it. So imagine you're an eight-year-old and you go to a typical treatment and you sit down in an office with a, with a psychologist and sometimes they'll talk to you and sometimes they'll pull out the Legos and they'll play with them and they're trying to shape your behavior, change your cognition in an office setting. Right? What are you expected to do? You're expected to learn the lesson and then take that lesson out into your life and figure out how it applies to your classroom and to your playground, which is a lot to ask an eight-year-old. In my opinion, a better approach is to say, let's go where eight-year-olds are, which is on soccer fields and in classrooms, and let's treat them there. They don't have to translate it when we can translate it. And that's the whole idea behind the summer camp. So it's typically Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Spend a part of the day in the classroom. You can see we have a good child to staff ratio because it's not uncommon that you'll have one kid that needs two staff because they're in timeout and they're spitting and hitting and punching and you need two staff to be there and then you have three staff with the other kids and then another kid's having a tough time so they need at the very least one counselor to stand next to them and pretty soon your staff to child ratio changes quickly. But they're doing just kid stuff all day. So for example here's a classroom that we have set up for them. So it's set up to be like a special education classroom where you have a low number of kids and uh, a teacher and a teacher aide and they turn their assignments in at the desk and they get immediate feedback on them. So we give them practice taking feedback from the teacher without getting angry. Here's an example of a recreation activity. So you can see there's lots of counselors around who are coaching them not only on their basketball skills, but also on giving them feedback on their behavior as they're doing these things. So if two kids get in a tussle over a ball and it escalates and the counselor's right there to process that and teach them how to do it better. And most importantly, we have a comprehensive point system. So every minute of every day, there's always one counselor recording every behavior the child does, both positive and negative. And we use that as the basis of our reinforcement system, and we use that as a measure for research purposes. So we have, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., token economy counts of how many times they're uh, antisocial, have conduct problems, how many times they're non-compliant or compliant, uh, how many times they say nice things to peers, all kinds of stuff are measured on an ongoing basis in the summer camp.
And then we motivate them by taking them to fun field trips. So here's a group on a field trip in a park in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Here's examples of the types of behaviors we record. So you can see following rules and sharing and so on. And then we have the same thing for negative categories. We also do things like timeouts and social skills training and so on. Here's a group of kids and counselors sitting together talking before and after every activity. We make sure that they know what's expected of them. If they follow the rules, they get points. If they don't, they get feedback on that and they lose points. So back to the main topic at hand here. We use the summer camp to study effects of treatments on kids with callous and unemotional traits. And the first study we did was a smaller sample. And our question was, well, we have evidence from one other study. At the time, it was one other study that behavioral treatments don't seem to work as well for kids with callousness. What if you add stimulant medication into the mix? So stimulants are the main treatment for disruptive kids, because most of these kids also have ADHD. Stimulants are things like Ritalin or Adderall or Concerta. And there's been around since almost 100 years now and show that they're very effective for improving kids' behavior, at least in the immediate sense. But nobody had ever looked at these in kids with callousness. Some people speculated that they would be effective, but other people speculated that they would actually make the situation worse. Because if they are impulsive, and if you're controlling their impulsiveness, then maybe you're opening the door for non-impulsive behaviors, right? So maybe if they stop making impulsive decisions, they'll have more time to think how they really want to get back at their friend. So nobody really knew whether these would help, hurt, or make no difference. So we did a study to look at it. And the way we did it was we gave kids good old-fashioned Ritalin, and we randomized the medication condition separately for each child, and it was randomized daily. So one day they would be on behavior therapy alone, one day they would be on a low dose of medication plus behavior therapy, and one day they would be on a high dose, and that was randomized every day over the course of the summer. And what we found is that it made a big difference in their behaviors. So here we see callous kids compared to non-callous kids who have conduct problems in the behavioral only condition. And this replicates what other people had shown at the time, which when you do intensive behavior therapy, the callous kids don't respond as well or don't respond sufficiently as compared to the non-callous kids. You add in a low dose of stimulant or low dose of Ritalin and that dramatically decreases. You add a higher dose of Ritalin and that almost makes the difference go away. Some of the reviewers thought, well, maybe this is just baseline severity. Maybe the kids with callousness come into camp with more antisocial behaviors, which I, part of me thinks that's a good critique, and part of me thinks it's not, because they, they, uh, they walk into camp, that's part of their condition, is that they have more antisocial behavior. So trying to say that we should separate it out seems to me uh, not, not valid. But we did it anyway, so we split the sample into those who had higher antisocial behaviors at baseline versus those who have lower, and we found the same trend. So among those who had higher baseline antisocial behavior, you, you see the same trend, and the same for kids with lower antisocial behavior. Now, one thing I want to point out here, you don't want to conclude here that that means that behavior therapy doesn't work for kids with uh, callousness, right? We don't have a control condition here. All we have is everybody's in treatment and does the addition of more treatment help. So for all we know, these callous kids started off way up here and it had a dramatic effect bringing them down to here, but we don't know that because we didn't have a no treatment condition. Maybe these guys started here and it only lowered them. So maybe it had a bigger treatment effect. What we can conclude is intensive behavioral treatment isn't sufficient for the callous kids. So we then sort of said, well, why is it that they are responding worse to behavioral treatment? And one of the hypotheses that's out there is that they are insensitive to punishment, that they don't respond as well when you apply negative consequences. And this largely comes out of adult psychopathy literature where it's very well established that uh, they have different reactions to aversive stimuli than non-psychopaths do. And there's also a number of lab tasks in kids which show similar trends, but it's a big leap to go from a lab task to an actual treatment. And we wanted to study whether that's the case. So we did what's called the Modified Reward Punishment Study, the MRPS study. And what we did is basically the same summer camp that I just talked about, but we divided it into two parts. One part, we did standard behavioral treatment where we were increasing rewards and decreasing punishments at about the same rate. So when they did positive things, they got rewards, but when they did negative things, they got punishments. They got points taken away from them. In the other condition, 
we tried to bump up the rewards and downplay the punishments. So you can never ever get rid of punishments altogether because there's some behaviors that are just so aversive that you have to jump in and do something. But we tried to downplay it. So essentially we're trying to give them a lot of incentive to do the right thing and trying to ignore as much misbehavior as we could. And we thought maybe this would fit with their learning style. And here's what we found. The red font indicates where the modified increased reward, decreased punishment treatment worked better than the standard. And the black font is where the standard worked better than the modified. So in contrast to what I hoped and what lots of other people have suggested, increasing rewards and decreasing punishments didn't work differentially well for the callous kids. And if anything, the opposite seemed to be true, that the standard treatment seemed to work a little bit better. Now this is measures of behavior. So this is point system data where you're counting number of aggressive, non-compliant, and so on behaviors. If you ask the parents, you got a somewhat of a different story. So parents at the end of each day rated their child, how are they doing today? And basically here you see just the opposite. So you see that the parents are saying the modified treatment worked better than the standard treatment. I think this is a confound. End of the day in the modified treatment, kids were much more likely to walk, uh, walk home with uh, some sort of tangible reward. So they could go to the toy store, earn a, a tangible present or a tangible reward for the points they earned. So when they see their parents, they just start walking out of the toy store and they're probably in a really good mood. And I don't wanna downplay that. Maybe that makes a big impact. If you come home with a kid who's in a better mood versus a worse mood, maybe that is a really important thing to show. But in terms of their camp behavior, we didn't see that. Surprisingly, the counselors who spent all day every day with the kid, we asked them at the end of the summer, what treatment do you think worked best? If going forward, if you could only pick one treatment, what would you do? The counselors were equally divided. So some of them said I would give standard behavioral treatment, some said I would give modified, some said either one is fine, and some said nothing worked for this kid. Right? So it's a complex picture here. So one of the biggest unanswered questions in this area is, what do these kids look like in real life settings? Almost all research in this area either comes from adolescents who are in forensic settings or kids who are brought into a lab setting. There's very little studies looking at what are they like in the actual school? What are, you, what are they like if you observe them in home? So we really don't know what they're like in these settings. We just published the one study looking at rule violations, but nobody's ever done an observational study in those. How do we best assess the U traits? There's a lot of new measures out there, but this area is still a mess. There's a lot of measurement work that needs to be done on this construct. Why do stimulant medications work? These kids are not particularly impulsive, yet when you give them medications that help impulsivity, at least in our study and the one other that's been done, they seem to get better. It doesn't make theoretical sense. So that's a, a big question. There's all kinds of questions about treatment that we don't have answered yet. We need to know what we can do to behavior modification to make it work better, and we need to know what treatments we should put in to uh, supplement behavioral treatments. And I just want to put my email address up there. I'm happy to send reprints or talk about this. And I'll, always happy to talk about my research, so uh, don't be shy about emailing and, and just wanting more information or asking reprints or whatever. Thanks again for inviting me. I, I enjoyed it. So, so the question was about gender differences in conduct problems. And there's uh, probably about the same time this research was getting going in the sort of mid to late 90s, uh, Nikki Crick was pointing out that very fact, which we historically have thought conduct problems are maybe three to six times higher in boys, but maybe we're missing a whole bunch of conduct problems in girls. And so she developed a number of measures of what's called relational aggression, which is using relationships against people. So gossiping on purpose, hurting other people's uh, reputation on purpose, those kinds of things. And I haven't really kept up with that literature as much as I should, but the last time I read, the rates of that type of aggression in girls very much paralleled the rates of more physical aggression in boys. So it seems like um, that's kind of how girls tend to express their aggression when they're in elementary school ages. The picture changes a bit when you get to be teenage years. So the question is, how do you, uh, how do you understand conduct problems that, that sort of takes the sort of social factors into account? So um, Part of it is that goes back to diagnosis, right? So we have our DSM Bible here that's got all the different symptoms that you need, and you need to have at least four out of eight symptoms of ODD, and then you need at least three out of 15 to get CD. But then you also look at whether there are other potential causes. So if the child recently moved, for example, and is having a hard time adjusting to that, then that rules out the disorders. And impairment is a really important one. So if they are, um, 
having those behaviors and it's causing them problems, then that's, um, you know, that gives you more confidence that the diagnosis is warranted. So it's always an important question. I agree that you don't want to, um, you don't want to treat kids who are, maybe they're, they have autism, for example, that sometimes can be confounded, but that's part of the diagnosis is making sure that these are not just kids with autism um, mislabeled. So in the diagnostic manual, um, you can, there's no lower limit on ODD, but of course at a certain point it's not, it's developmentally normative to be oppositional when you're two years old. Um, so that's part of what your job is as a clinician. Um, but there's lots of research now looking at that very question. So how young can we go? So one of the things I didn't talk about here is uh, my colleague Mike Willoughby, who's at uh, University of North Carolina, is part of a longitudinal study that started measuring infants and then has followed them up. And I think they're in uh, just hitting teenage years now. So we looked at if you evaluate their callousness at age eight and you identify those who are and are not callous and then go back and look at their data that was collected as an infant, can you differentiate them? And the answer was yes. And we differentiated them not only on their parent rating, so their parents thought about them in a very strange way. So they thought their two-year-old was kind of out to get them, right? So there's kind of odd parent cognitions that were going on and also their physiology. So we predicted that they had to have lower physiology, but in fact, they had higher physiology. So pure speculation, but what we thought is, maybe these are kids who start in high stress environment, and one way to react to stress is to dampen your own physiological reaction to it, right? So if your baseline, if your environment is causing your physiology to be up here, and you, you lower your baseline to make that normal, then when your environment gets better, your physiology is gonna go abnormally low. Total speculation. Other people are starting to study that. So Ava Camonis is looking at callousness in preschoolers, for example. It's a, it's a really hot area. So the question is what about intentionality and sort of more broadly about measurement? And in a word, measurement in this area is a mess, right? So they, they had the APSD, which is the one that most of this literature has been done on, but it had low internal consistency, low alpha reliability. So then they made a new version which has good internal consistency but nobody can figure out the factor structure of it, right? Some people think there's two. We did a study, we found that all the positive items loaded on one and all the negative items loaded on another. Some people report four factors. So I think the, the broader answer is we need tons more work here. I think something's going on here, but I don't think we know what it is yet. In terms of intentionality, um, there are self-report measures of callousness, right? And those show similar findings. I've always been a little skeptical of those. First of all, I don't think elementary school age kids have the capacity to fill them out. Um, teenagers, I think, have the capacity, but to me it's, it strikes me as a little bit odd that you're asking deceitful, manipulative kids about their callousness. That said, my skepticism aside, you get similar findings no matter how you measure it, parent, teacher, or self-report. So we're tapping something. I don't think we're tapping it well. <laughs> yeah.